Now, one of the fun topics that we've been exploring on this channel lately are some strange and interesting engines that automakers produced over the years. And one of the things that spawned a number of strange engines were instances where automakers either added or dropped off cylinders to an original engine configuration to make another engine. A great example of this would be the Buick 3.8 liter V6 that was really based on the Buick 215 cubic inch V8 that was introduced for the 1961 model year. The Buick Fireball V6 was based on it, although made of cast iron and only had six cylinders in 90 degree form and was introduced in 1962 as a way to help Buick lower the entry level price point for the 1962 Buick Special so that it could better compete in the marketplace. Of course, there are many other instances of this happening from other automakers. Chevrolet lopping off two cylinders of its V8 to create the 4.3 liter V6. AMC taking its six cylinder engine and lopping two cylinders off to make the 2.5 liter four cylinder. Ford lopping off four cylinders of its original proposed 60 degree double overhead cam V12 configuration and creating the GAA 1100 cubic inch all aluminum double overhead cam flat plane crank V8 engine that was used in World War II Sherman tanks. And yes, I said that right. Be sure to check out one of the videos on my channel for more detail about that engine. And one of the more, let's say, famous engines to employ this technique was the Pontiac Trophy 4 that was introduced in the 1961 Tempest. The Trophy 4 was quite literally half of a 389 cubic inch V8. And take a look here, you can see that it is literally a 389 V8 with the driver's side cylinders missing. Just has the passenger cylinder bank. And that driver's side area fills a number of other things, including the starter and some other componentry. That was obviously a large four-cylinder being half of a 389 cubic inch V8. It displaced about 195 cubic inches, 194 and a half to be exact. But there's another automaker that employed a similar technique to develop a few four-cylinder engines, and that was International Harvester. Now, International Harvester produced many awesome pickup trucks and sport utility vehicles over a number of years, often outfitted with engines that were designed, engineered, and produced by International itself. Although they did use engines from other automakers in some cases, including American Motors six-cylinder engine and a few vehicles. But when International introduced the Scout for the 1961 model year, it was looking for a, an appropriate powertrain and according to International, it just couldn't find one in the marketplace so it needed to develop one itself. Let's take a look at this ad for International's new 152 cubic inch Comanche four-cylinder engine that was introduced in that 1961 Scout now. As you can see here, take a look at the text of this advertisement. And in the first paragraph, you see International says, during the development period of the Scout, practically every available four-cylinder automotive engine was considered. None satisfied all engineering requirements. In view of tremendous popular acceptance accorded International six- and eight-cylinder engines, it was decided to design an all-new four-cylinder model embodying similar principles and many identical parts. The result is the Comanche engine that delivers exactly the right amount of responsive power with frugal use of standard grade gasoline. And thus the 152 cubic inch Comanche engine was born and the Comanche engines, the four cylinders would be the base engine in the Scout. And in the 1961 model year, this 152 cubic inch four cylinder was the only Comanche engine offered in international Scout lineup. Now, as I said, this Comanche four-cylinder was effectively, just like the Pontiac Tempest Trophy 4, half of an international V8, more specifically, half of the international 304 cubic inch V8, hence it's 152 cubic inches. And it shared many, many components, including valve train components, cylinder heads, pistons, connecting rods, etc., with that larger 304 V8. So, it was extremely economical to engineer as well as produce. The only somewhat unfortunate part about this new four-cylinder engine is that, let's just say it was debatable that it gave the customer the right amount of quote-unquote responsive power. 
93 horsepower was not exactly something that was going to get your 3,000 pound-ish Scout up to speed with any amount of speed or really give it an ability to maintain that speed on steep hills. It did have decent torque at about 135 pound-feet, but still that wasn't great for a relatively heavy vehicle. As time would go on, International would employ a number of solutions to solve that, including turbocharging the 152 cubic inch four-cylinder in the 1965 model year and endowing it with 111 horsepower. It's pretty surprising that International would take this approach with its four-cylinder engine as turbocharging back in this time frame was quite rare indeed. In fact, the Corvair Monza as well as the Oldsmobile Jetfire were really the first automobiles sold in the U.S. to have turbocharged engines in mass-produced form, and that occurred just in 1962, a few years prior to International turbocharging its 152 cubic inch four-cylinder engine. For 1965, International would upgrade the Scout and now call it the Scout 800 versus the Scout 80 that it was previously called. It had a number of changes, including now a fixed windshield as opposed to one that was movable. But for 1966, the big news would come on the four-cylinder front as the 152 cubic inch four-cylinder would now have a sister, the 196 cubic inch four-cylinder Comanche engine that was based off of International's larger V8. More specifically, this 196 was based off of International's larger 392 cubic inch V8 engine as opposed to the 152 being based off of International's 304 cubic inch engine. The 196 did offer a bit more power than the standard 90-ish horsepower 152 cubic inch Comanche 4, and it made 111 horsepower in its inaugural model year. Still not great power, let's just say, for a 3,000 plus pound vehicle, but better than what it had before. And perhaps because the Scout now had this 196 cubic inch V8 after the 1967 model year, the turbocharged 152 cubic inch four-cylinder was dropped. And perhaps another reason why the turbo four-cylinder was dropped is that partway through the 1967 model year, International really started focusing on more powerful engines, especially as the V8 Bronco was introduced. In response, International dropped its own 266 cubic inch V8 into the Scout, which made around 155-ish horsepower, so better than the four cylinders, but still not all that great, even by the standards of the time, I would say. As the years progressed and the Scout became the Scout II partway through the 1971 calendar year, International would introduce a growing array of engines under hood, including AMC six cylinders to complement the 196 cubic inch Comanche four cylinder engine, as well as the complement of International V8s. Interestingly, while International did place AMC six cylinders under hood, they never used another AMC power plant in the Scout II, either four or eight cylinder. But as I mentioned, they did use AMC inline six cylinders under hood in some cases as an engine option. So in summary, with its 152 and 196 cubic inch four cylinder engines, International had found a great and cost effective way to introduce a smaller and more fuel efficient and cheaper power plant under hood of its Scout vehicles. Now, the one drawback to this design, well, there are a number of drawbacks, but one large one, especially with a 196 cubic inch four-cylinder engine, was just the coarseness of it. Four cylinders are inherently imbalanced, and the larger they get, the more their secondary vibrations just tend to show. Now, perhaps some of this coarseness was a little bit more acceptable in a truck or a truck-like vehicle like the Scout, as opposed to the 1961 Tempest. And International certainly didn't have the Tempest rope drive to help smooth out some of the engine's vibrations. And overall, I think customers deemed the engine to be okay. It wasn't really overly powerful. It was somewhat coarse, but it tended to be reliable. And I think that's really what the truck buyers of this era were looking for. After all, just ask individuals what they think about Iron Duke four-cylinder engines under hood of Chevrolet S10s, and you almost universally get praise for them, despite the fact that they really drove many passenger car buyers away from General Motors in the 1980s timeframe because 
they were so unrefined compared to other Japanese vehicles and the engines that were under hood in them. So, in any case, the International Scout and the Comanche 152-196 cubic inch engines were successful, they were durable, and they allowed the Scout to be produced with eh, some cheap, cost-effective engines under hood. Now, International produced a number of awesome sport utility vehicles, as I mentioned, over their history. I have to say that while the Scout and the Scout II are pretty cool, my favorite happens to be the International Travel All, kind of the Chevrolet GMC Suburban of the International fleet. And I had an opportunity to buy one of these years ago that was fully loaded with the largest V8 under hood, and I passed it up, and that's one of the regrets that I have. But we're going to save a discussion on the International Harvester Travel All. And instead, we'll just close out with some final factoids about International Harvester, and more specifically, its logo, this combined IH design, which was designed by none other than Raymond Lowy of Studebaker and Coke Bottle fame. Lowy was employed by International for a period of time and really helped revamp its lineup. But one of the other things that he did was redesign the International Harvester logo into the logo that you see here, this combination of I and H. Now, many people see it as a combination of an I and H, and that makes logical sense because it stands for International Harvester, obviously. But Lowy actually hid another detail in the design, and that is, if you take a look again at the logo, it does resemble a farmer riding a tractor, if you're looking at it from the rear. You can see the two wheels as well as the individual riding atop the tractor, again, from the rear of the tractor. So I thought that was a cool detail that some folks may not know, and it was done by an individual who was really a design powerhouse under whom Virgil Exner worked and what is arguably one of the most beautiful cars ever designed, the 1953 Studebaker, that was actually penned under Raymond Lowy's direction. So International Harvester has some interesting ties to other elements of automotive history and we'll talk about those in a subsequent issue. Till then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching.